My name is Paige Bechtel. And I'm Natasha Jalot, and this is The Student's Perspective. We are here live at the Market Square at High Point, North Carolina, casting our web series. And today our guest is Tim DeSanto. Yes. Hi, Tim. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. Great and to be here. <laughs> will you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. How much time do you have? <laughs> Quite a while. A couple, couple hours. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I'm a designer. Uh, I'm an artist, designer, musician, wear a variety of hats. Um, I live in Nashville, Tennessee, currently, um, and I I, uh, I do furniture, interiors, and right now I'm doing ground up builds. I designed a couple of residences that I, I'm doing on my own. Um, as I say to design friends when they're like, who are you, what are you doing right now, who are you working for? I'm like, no one but myself. I'm like, kind of the snarky guy who doesn't really want to, you know, I don't want someone telling me what to do, but uh, I seem to be able to do some things that people love, so that's a positive thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I am like insanely intrigued by your entire background, and I know that there's a lot of different categories that we have to cover just regarding your life as a designer right. Right. and every aspect of it, and I shamelessly read through your bio on your website today uh. just so I could <laughs> maybe I understand that. a little bit more, but... I think we won't understand you entirely until we dive into the different backgrounds of sure. who you are and where you began. Um, but your education in itself, how do you okay. think that has started or compelled your career? I know that's a great question, and I know what I should say. <laughs> um, but uh, and actually, Rachel Moriarty, my friend Rachel, and I were talking about this. Um, really important in different ways, but kind of relationally. The relationships I developed there and the, the, the things I saw people doing and the paths they were taking, I feel like were actually more important for me. I have a degree in uh, business and art, both. Uh, my brother was a uh, kind of a fairly well-known American photorealist. I kind of got pulled into that. Then I met my wife who was a fine artist and I managed her. At the time, I didn't have while I had an art background, I was a ski racer. So I raced on the, the Audi Quattro tour and managed her art business, and then slowly got pulled. I would say my wife, Dawn, uh, uh, pulled me into the creative direction. It was already there, I was doing it. Um, but that's, that's kind of how it happened. So school, university for me, I would say um, it got me there and allowed me to explore the different things I enjoyed uh, in terms of creativity, but it, it feels very intuitive to me. I, when I, what I do is coming out of my head and kind of was always there. That's a fair, uh, a fair answer. But yeah. I feel like I have enough questions in self about your life because I think that <laughs> creative background is so interesting. Yes. I see how those intertwine as well, even yeah. at like an early age in college too. Yeah. Um, that's really crazy. Um, and I did see something about uh, photographic deconstruction, maybe, or? My yeah, background in doing, yeah, I did, um, I've done a variety of things in terms of my own artwork. Yeah, yeah. Um, And the first thing that I did, other than the design side, was uh, large format color photography. I was doing it in, trying to think of timing, in the 90s when, and she did uh, like juried art shows around the country. And I had a number of friends that did shows like that. There were a lot of people who were doing photography and doing things digitally and developing you know, color work with a lab, but really weren't technically allowed to do that. Shows hadn't made the jump to say, like color, color work is a machine driven process. So the idea that I somehow have to own my own color machine to develop my work, it's a machine process. Like it, there's no, there's not a lot of art going on. I capture the image, I get it, I print it out. The art is there. Once you have that done, it spits out the image. People really didn't want to hear that. So they weren't saying they did that. So I all of a sudden decided to do a body of work and I shot a lot of, basically the whole winter in Florida. Um, South Beach, a lot of deco architecture. I, I would take the images with a film camera, use a film, digital film recorder to put it into a digital image go in in Photoshop and I would overlay images. And it wasn't, it wasn't significant. A lot of it was cutting things out and putting skies in that weren't actually there. So it wasn't necessarily a significant enhancement, but it wasn't an image that was captured in the camera. And I would enter these shows. And the first year I got into some really major shows. And when people, 
that I knew, friends that were, had done shows for years, realized what I was doing, they were exactly. furious. Yeah. They were so, no one had done those shows. Uh, Old Town in Chicago was one, which is a really great show. No one had done them, and I was saying, hey, I do, I do digitally enhanced imagery, this is the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The shows let me in, I wasn't tricking anyone, yeah. but they were completely freaked out. And so they held a meeting after Old Town, based on my work, that I went to, uh -huh. and I remember a moment where the, someone who will remain uh, nameless, who was a friend from Philadelphia, who does these incredibly gorgeous, huge images of flowers, like looking under the bed of tulips, and um, came over to me, and pretty emotional, and he said, uh, he said, you know what, I really appreciate what you're doing. He said, actually, I, I use uh, I use a machine, you know, I, I do that, but I've never, I've never told him. So here's this guy who's doing shows for probably 15, 20 years, Kept winning awards, who never said that's how he... Yeah. So he shows up at the meeting and he stands up and he was like people, you know, yeah. fessing up to... And I, I was just saying, hey, this is what I do. Yeah. And people were upset and then he stood up and he's like, actually, I have to say that's what I do as well. People were like, oh. yeah. <laughs> you know? So that... I'm excited that that kind of shifted it. Mm -hmm. I. I think I did, I stayed with the photography probably three years on the show side and then uh, made the jump to furniture. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the interior, yeah. That's, well, I think yeah. that's just a funny transition. I think art <laughs> kind of is the backbone of where design can lend itself to. Right. But I also think exactly what you did with your photographic work lends itself to how innovative as a designer you, you are and how that sets you apart from everyone else. And I just like understanding the process of film, people don't use those things to their advantage when right, they could. Right. And there's no sense if you don't lose any part of the process by either post processing or digitally analyzing things. And like even just from scanning my own film, I see that translation and oh, it's just, it was very cool. Right. Yeah. But do you, do you feel like in, I feel like even when you're in school, it's art. Mm -hmm. So the idea is this unlimited creative freedom, and yet you've got these constraints, and yeah. I'm kind of like, yeah. it's art. Why would we? Why would you put parameters? Rules are meant to be broken. Right. Every and professor <laughs> is going to hate me now for saying No, that. no. The, but we also <laughs> kind of understand those constraints in self when we're getting yeah, we an assignment. As right. long as you have reasoning or support to the to why you're making those rules right. or then it's successful. setting those standards for yourself, you can create your own set of guidelines right. for every project that you do. Right. Um, I'm and it, so it, it enhances what you do, I think. Yeah, yes. it's always it's always part of your process. And right. The iterative process is something that we support really highly at Marywood University in general, I would say. So especially in the architecture program, I think knowing why you did something or where it came from is always more important than maybe the final picturesque result. Right, yes. right. Yeah, it's definitely. I, I think I have different mantras, and I'm, I'm significantly focused on not recreating the past. Yeah. At the same time, I appreciate people that do, but for my head, I feel like it's, I feel like definitely in design and architecture, we've got a lot of people doing period things and, and saying, yeah, I live in East Nashville, and people will kind of flip out about uh, everyone changing things, and it needs to be the way it was, and, and I say, you know, it'll be 100 years from now, and we'll look back, and everything that was done was to recreate what was done in late 1800s, early mm -hmm. 1900s, and people will say, why didn't, what, nothing changed from this point, you know, the last hundred years, it all looked the same. Who wants that? You know, like, let's keep the best of the past, move forward and do great designs that become new classics, and then do the next wave and the next one, you know. So I'm definitely focused on, like, pushing that and, and doing fresh new things. For sure. Yeah, so I guess you talked about, like, photography being an artist. Um, did that ever, like, overlay into, like, a furniture design? Or did it kind of go to a dead stop and then did you pick up furniture? Or do you still kind of do a little no, of it, it all? No, it kind of stopped. <laughs> really? Uh, I'm, I, I think my, it's a plus and a minus. I tend to, I do this and accomplish what I want to mm -hmm. with it. And then I see something and then I like, oh. You know, <laughs> do that I hate to see it's like the squirrel and ice yeah, age. It's yeah, like, kind of like oh, your an personality. acorn. You know? Yes. Um, but that, that is kind of how it worked. Um, so I jumped into furniture with a design partner and we did a number of pieces that were hands-on. We were doing the welding, cutting everything. Um, and then I ended up doing a piece with the company here at High Point and they 
encouraged me to do like offer uh, panels of imagery on the thing, but it wasn't my work actually. It was like I in this particular piece, I liked the idea of showing. I shouldn't say it wasn't my work. It was like my blueprints, okay. so of of structures. Yeah. Um, so, but it, but then then we didn't launch that piece. So it's the nature of the industry, right? Like, oh, we're doing this. Oh, no. Funny. Can't get How ironic. Yeah. It's kind of like what we have going on here with our universities, like the University Hall of Innovation. We kind of do like these small scale pieces, right? The right. furniture, and then we have the voting going on in the booths to see which ones will come back in the spring, right? Full scale, right? And then from there, how far will they go? And, and of course, that's not that's not a constraint. Anyone else could take their pieces wherever they want to, right? Yes. I mean, money is money matters. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying it doesn't have to be the end. It reminds me of uh, American Idol with people like, oh, this was my only opportunity. I'm like, really? Like, you know, why don't you just go play music and record some music? Like, so yeah, these yeah. pieces. There's some great pieces here. Why not, right? Yeah. So you Do definitely it. want to talk about music. You already brought it up. Music. <laughs> music. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I have been involved in writing and recording music for a long time. Um, so that that's another thread that kind of runs through everything. Um, and I've been spending time off and on in Nashville for probably 20 years, almost 20 years, uh, writing and recording or the odd competition or a showcase for a label or something. Um, currently I play blackdenimband.com is the website. Um, and uh, while music's a little bit on hold, just because I have these two builds going, which I'll get into yes. at some point here, but yes. um, I can't, you know, I'd like to be able to do it all and I can't. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I have to get them built and get those done. Mm -hmm. So the music, I, I jump in whenever I can and go in and tweak something, whatever. But I have, uh, Black Denim is, it's been a few years of work. Um, there's a new single, the new single that comes out with it will be, it's called When You're Dead. And it's a, it, it is, <laughs> the, lyrically, but the idea is there are all these things going, running through it, but um, it, it's not so bad. It's like, think about it, you know, there's, we're thinking of all these things, we have so many things to deal with. And when you're dead, it's just like, ah, you know, it's like the idea of like, release. Like, I don't have to please anyone, I don't have to do anything. Now, of course, yeah. I don't want to die. I'm not advocating suicide. I'm not, it's not that. Yeah. But it's just kind of this snarky take, like my design work is. Um, but yeah, I really enjoy writing and recording. I have a lot of friends in Nashville that I work with. Um, it's my thing, so I bring, tend to bring people in to play music with me. Um, and I, you know, I'm generally singing it and, and penning the lyrics and the melodies and things like that. Um, but yeah, so that might, yeah, the shameless self-promotion, the blackdenimband.com, <laughs> Everything's on there. Right now there's only one single that's out on Spotify. I stripped everything else off because I don't want any confusion. Um, and it's called Here's to Eleven, and it's a, a unofficial theme song for um, Stranger Things. Oh. So anyone that's a Stranger Things, any Stranger Things fans? Yes, yes, oh. Uh, there's a video on YouTube that goes with it that's uh, seriously ridiculous. Like, um, awesome. really yes, has to it. Yeah, 
I have a son. <laughs> uh, Rio, Rio De Santo is one of my sons. Mm -hmm. yes. Lives in LA. He's a filmmaker, and mm -hmm. he kindly I flew him to Nashville and hired him to direct the video. Wow. So we got a, an abandoned a house that was being redone, sledgehammer to the wall, uh -huh. like. Uh -huh. Uh, Jason Marsden from Full House and uh, the boyfriend from Full House, that's way back. Uh, he's also you know, one of the voices in Goofy movies and Rug Rugrats and all these things. Jason's in the video and oh, Noni see. Mason from Stomp and like all these, so it's really fun. So yeah. take a look at uh, Here's that to 11 by Black Denim, movie. it's a YouTube video. For sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, all kinds of stuff. Well, exactly yeah. what you started to say about the song that you're releasing, I think the balance of all of your creative outlets, how have you handled that? Because I, I kind of relate to that personally, just thinking about all the passions that, and different hobbies sure. that have pulled me in a lot of different directions. And it almost made it really difficult to choose interior architecture as a major. I had no idea what I was really going to get into going into college. And I somehow felt that interior architecture encompassed all of them, like that being photography, design, art, music. Like It sort of does that for me, but how would you describe how it does that for you? I think, to be very honest, I'm always distracted. Not a good thing. <laughs> so, as cool as it is, I get doing Design Star on HGTV, I got the Renaissance tag because no one else, I could, hey, I can lay tile, you know, oh, I can, I can, you know, pour concrete, I can stain this, I can build that. Sounds really cool, except that then you're like utilized, you're not really a designer. All of a sudden, like, oh, Tim can do that. I'm just a worker then. Yeah. So, uh, it's difficult for me. I, I constantly have to think about what's that focus, like the houses. Okay, I have two houses, it's a lot of money. I need to get these done. One of them needs to get sold and I need to have a place to live and work in the other one for now. So it's a bit easier to focus, but even then I'm pulled, like music's just sitting there and there are three videos that aren't edited. And, <laughs> um, but I, I strongly uh, encourage people to focus. Uh, just because I, I think we see that when someone's kind of maniacally focused on what they're doing, they tend to get a lot further, you know? It's been great that I can do a variety of things, but I honestly think I'd get further if I just stepped away from some of these and just just designed and did this, or just wrote, you know, wrote and recorded music and did black denim. And, so I'm trying to do that, but in terms of school, not an easy thing. You're being, you know, so it's early, early on, right? so early. Yes. How do you make this? How do you guys make the decisions, or do you have other things that pull you away? I, don't know. I guess that's like kind of like a post-college type thing. You kind of want to see like which path takes you, which definitely helps like being here at High Point and like talking to like design industries and like what paths like they chose. It's like right. so inspirational for us too because we're like we would never think of these things like to try out our tests, but like we could end up loving it. Like, right. There could be so much passion in that. Yeah, it becomes ex like extremely difficult to balance different outlets at school for me. Like even with work between different, like I'm a major and a minor, and even those different mindsets like right. are hard to balance in my head and where I focus my work. But it does ask you to give up some things in your life too. Like I maybe quit sports my last year of college right. just to maybe put myself more into interiors, like in clubs, and extracurriculars, and things like that. But Because you can't do it all. Yeah, I mean, you can't and be really always. good at it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and put your full effort in. And it's right. hard to not feel like you're putting in your entire 110% of right. passion and effort into what you're doing, uh, which has always been a struggle for me. But hopefully that alleviates, maybe now hearing your side, maybe it doesn't alleviate once I leave college. But <laughs> we'll see where it pulls us. No, you. hopefully <laughs> you'll see things that, that you can focus on that you're passionate about and, yes. and get you through. And there are definitely times, like now, I. I'd love to be finishing that album and doing vid the videos, but I, it'll happen. Yeah. You know, I'm building a studio with one of these houses I'm going to work out of. So for me, I'm like, when that's done, I can step into that space and now step away from design yeah. for a moment and finish the there and shoot out of the And that's always good stuff. Sure. I guess while you're talking about it, do you want to give us a little intake on these projects? Yes. The projects. Uh, Let's go, we've been yeah. waiting yeah. an hour. <laughs> um, I'm really excited about these houses. Uh, I call them the Mineta Builds in East Nashville. They're on Mineta Avenue. Um, and I'm working on a 50 foot wide by 220 foot long sloping lot. It has about 20 feet, 22 feet of fall, pretty consistently through the lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so there's a front house and a back house. Nashville has an ordinance that allows you to build two houses on one lot, which has driven development kind of out of control. And what developers typically do, who aren't designers or artists, they're just developers and they're just making money, will come in on a 50 foot wide lot and make two skinny houses that are like 15 feet wide, six feet apart, super long, it looks like Noah's Ark basically. Huh. They're gabled in the front, they're really aesthetically uninspiring and almost like, ah, like a camp do, you know. So yeah. anyone doing that in Nashville, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's happening all over. So I came in and decided I wanted to do a front and a back house, kind of pull them apart, make them their own space. Mm. Um, and there's, it would be difficult for me not to say, when people look at them, they say falling water. Like right away they're like, oh, Frank Lloyd Wright. True, I love Frank Lloyd Wright, but I, they're not a spin particularly. Um, I'm using that lot, and when you come up above the, the houses, all of the roofs are uh, offset angles. So they might have a clean, a straight back edge, but these will grow out like this, and then this one grows further in the front. So I have overhangs that are kind of points, cantilevered points, that come out anywhere from like four to 10 feet beyond the house. Um, which has created a massive headache for because builders don't typically do that in Nashville. Mm -hmm. I'm like, wait, wait, how are you supporting that? You know? um, and then I've got cantilevered all of the balconies, of which there are, are many, and they wrap the corners, are also cantilevered. So cantilevered corners become challenging because you've got to have two thirds back in the house, we don't have enough space, so a lot of engineering to figure out there. Um, two-thirds rule never fails. Two -thirds, yeah, I mean it works, right? Yeah. It's, except when you have a corner where you don't have the two-thirds. So yeah. we kind of have a we kind of have a, a beam LVL, this engineered lumber superstructure thing that's boxed in to do that. Um, the so when you look at the top, it to, what I'm going for on that is it feels kind of like a surface that water would flow down, mm -hmm. kind of like rocks in a stream, and you can imagine the water mm -hmm. falling down the roofs and falling off the edges and it's stepped the whole way down the lot. So this one has two levels, and then the next one starts a little lower and has three levels. Um, and then they're anchored by, each anchored by a massive concrete block wing um, that were scary. They were built before the framing, and they're about 30, once like 31 feet off the floor height, and so it's probably 38 feet off the ground. 32 inches wide, 14 feet long, just this big concrete block wing. And the feel there is the soils in that area are very super rocky, mm -hmm. lots of layering of, of stone. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that we're kind of pulling that right out of the ground. The anchor point is kind of this, the indigenous soil. Yeah. And there are these huge rocks that are anchoring the house. Mm -hmm. um, and they have inside, they have fireplace cutouts mm -hmm. in them. And the one on and up the second house has an opening so the deck will go through it and you can actually walk under the wing, under this block wing. So, two studios on one of the house, one of the houses that we have to live in for two years to avoid capital gains. So, we're going to move into that, live okay. there, work there, and then sell it. And, but I'm just going to keep uh, multiplying, doing two more, doing two more. Um, and building only for yourself. Yeah, building for myself. I mean, if, if the right thing came along, I have designed for people in the past a number yeah. of times, mm -hmm. um, but right now being able to do kind of exactly what I want yeah. mm -hmm. um, and and get away with it, like the the treatments on these houses, uh, all the interior trims plywood, finished three quarter inch plywood in layers, so the windows are boxed out, you're looking at the edge, so you might see like 16 layers here mm -hmm. around each of them, it's very thin. Um, none or recess trim on the base so the drywall is coming right down off the floor maybe half an inch off um, just things that are kind of like why do we do what we do you know mm -hmm. like uh, but if you're working with people in the construction industry their thought is um, we can we'll just trim that out we'll just trim that out I'm like no 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 this is this is the, they're kind of framing the finished thing mm -hmm. so it makes it difficult uh, makes it very difficult to make that, to communicate that, which would be uh, something that hopefully you run into in school when you're doing projects and yeah. you've got to communicate to a professor or to someone else or in a competition. You yeah. find a way to communicate what you're doing and yeah. make it work. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely always competing opinions, whether it be within like, the wood shop or workshop scenarios. Everyone has their different 
work flow. Right. With Which different approaches. Approach to different yeah. yeah. But and if you work, you have to work with people. I mean, yeah, often. <laughs> you team up. You team up on some of the projects. Yeah, they do like even like half and half. Like mm -hmm. we have like a whole year dedicated to like working with okay. another student. So it's like you have to have that balance of like you have to agree on the stuff. Right. Right. But then it is like I said, it's also more supportive than like challenging too. Okay. Like it was nice to have like support. It gets second set of years, but then. Is it more supportive than challenging? Like no, it's where is more challenging, okay. but then it's it definitely depends maybe, who you're working with. But I think yeah. anyone could agree with that. It depends. It's on like our class in general, just like how we are. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like professors are teachers are supportive? Also depends on the professor. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not talking about anyone in particular, right? <laughs> no, 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 I agree. A lot of the times they're there to just filter our mindset. They're never giving you a clear designated. Um, Point of finish. Right. They try to help you see it's where guidance. it's going to involve. Yeah, it's always guidance. It's not telling you where you're going to end up. Right. So right. maybe our five iterations lead you to that one, but they're not going to explicitly tell you which one is the best iteration. Right. So. And how, how does uh, I have to ask this because of my background and and current social media everything? How does that play into pursuing design in a college university setting, there is an option now to be a, a voice for design and not even do design. You know, yeah. I mean, I know people that are designers, but they actually don't design, mm -hmm. and they do have a voice in the industry. And they, there is always television. I mean, I'm always, yeah. I always like to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. How did, how you might that work? Wonder why we're here What's right that? now. I said, you wonder why we're here yeah, right this is, now. This is, yeah, it's exactly. What we're yeah. I think High Point has also changed our perspective on that entirely. And maybe it's not something that everyone in our university sees, but social media has impacted, I think, the lot of our school, whether that be through Pinterest, um, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, and where they're drawing inspiration from. It also becomes a point of wanting to reference something maybe too explicitly in a lot of scenarios, like, mm -hmm. in not the best way. I think sometimes it maybe loses our creative interest, but I also think there's no absolute possible way anyone could ever copy something entirely. I think design is always evolving and the fact that it's okay to reference the past and make for a better future. Mm -hmm. yeah. We talk about timelines, I think, a lot. And yeah, we don't. Sometimes in our conceptual backing, even social media and the way that our generation is changing, influences a lot of our projects and right, how right, we think yeah. of that future tense. But is there anyone in the program you're in that are carving a niche in social media already? They're in school and they're pursuing that kind of thing? Well and I looked over there like is we there would be the here? crew oh, no. to say so, I think. It would be kind of like the group of us that definitely okay. do so. Okay. But um, I myself have a minor in photography along with some of the other students that have kind of gone through the interior architecture program and I think that's funny to see how that overlaps into what we do and the way we exploit everything that we do. Like I think we talk a lot about, this, I don't want to say aesthetic because I don't love that word, but the way that we actually display what's happening and how people see us from another major too, like people at our school, the way they look at interior architecture I think is very unique and they kind of set us maybe to a higher standard or I'd like to think. Um, and it kind of represents this pristine image of what we do and either our workspace or our workflow and how we process things. Right. They don't get it and they don't need to get it, but mm -hmm. as long as we get our process, I think it's cool how we can show it to them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the way we present ourselves is really important to us, and that's what we're trying to change, I think, with future generations of interior architecture at our school explicitly, and which is why we're also doing this show, so people get an idea of right. the conversations we have, and mostly to gain the confidence to be talking to people in the industry, right. for sure, because a lot of people are, like, kitty cornered, they're shelled in, like, they're afraid to express, like, even just their, their thoughts, like the simplest thing, never mind like talents, just right. have conversation, right. Right. like talk about things. And a lot of people, like a lot of students, just hold that in. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. even if you say the like, different career paths and professions, like that's what we grasp more from being here and seeing the different outlets to what we could possibly mm -hmm. do. And even just being in the field or working you know, at my firm, I see those things too, even talking about being a sales representative or working for some niche program. Right. It's not exactly what we talk about in school because we want to give you the full yeah. Yeah. breed of education and not limit yourself in any aspect, but right. Right. it needs to be made aware that that's a possibility and to everyone. Do you find, I feel like whenever I come to market, 
you, everyone, a lot of people would like everyone else to think they have it figured out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as as you get older, you realize that generally nobody has it. Even if it's going, you know, you have runs where things are amazing. I mean, I've part different. Your know, life is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I'm always kind of looking at what might be next and how I want to, might want to reinvent myself. Even though what, I'm enjoying what I'm doing, I like doing these builds. I like that. I like the music. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, what else? What else is out there? Kind of brainstorming that. And I think that's like a wake-up call. You tend to think when you're younger that like you look at a given person like, oh, I'd love to be doing what they're doing. Then you actually figure out what they're doing. What are you doing? And then you're like, oh, really? Like, it's not quite yeah. as straightforward as you thought it was. And yeah. so maybe that's not really, I'm not offering a lot of stability and no, emotional stability by saying that. But, but it's a good thing to know everyone's trying to figure it out all the time you know, in some way. But I think you've been able to balance it by the way you gone back and forth in your career too, right. to where you've been able to handle all those different aspects. And I don't, I don't see myself ever almost being able to accomplish that. Being either mm -hmm. dealing with furniture at such a minute scale, and then architecture to architecture, right. Right. grasping that exterior at such a graphics. I have to say, my wife uh, Dawn. Uh, she went by Dawn Marie as a printmaker, did zinc plate etchings and then mixed media etchings um, and was really wildly successful with that, selling mm -hmm. those all over the country and, and outside of the U.S. as well. Um, and then shifted to clothing about 22 years ago, 23 years ago, started designing clothing um, and has done that. Now designs her own line of clothing called Handjive, handjiveclothing.com. Um, she's at a show outside D.C. right now with her, with her clothing brand. Uh, very stable. Like she's done things for a long time, does them really well, focused, yes. really successful. I'm like, oh, I'm doing that, I'm doing that. Like, you know, so no. that's, I have to be <laughs> grateful for her yeah. allowing me to do the crazy things I do yeah. because yes. it wouldn't work if we were both doing crazy stuff. That's you know? true. You have to live. You know? Keeps so you well around. No income here from me and no income from her. Fantastic. You know? So Gosh. Wow. thank you, Dawn. Yes. I, there's so many more questions that we want to ask, but we are getting short on time. But there is one thing I want you to explain. I know like previously like on the red carpet and like the parties afterwards, can you explain the signatures on the jacket as well as the dog head? The sure. <laughs> Patty. Yes. Patty the Poodle. Um, <laughs> yeah. And sadly, Patty didn't come along. Oh. I looked at those things, which have been at market, I think the past... Well, the jacket was last market. Mm -hmm. Patty was here last market, and, and I think two markets, maybe, at least. And my thought, well, there are certain people we hang out with, and few of them could come to market. And I thought, this is going to be different. So fortunately, Rachel Moriarty, Moriarty's here. We can hang out together, but we're missing the Cohen brothers. Uh, Joseph Hacker's around, but we're kind of not this collective that we usually yeah. are. So. Um, I looked at the jacket and Patty and I thought, you know what, I'm going to give them a rest and I'll bring, uh, probably bring one of them back next market, but I may probably shift what I'm going to do. Yes. But the idea of the jacket was, um, people come to market and it's overwhelming and they're, you know, you talk to people and they're like, oh my goodness, I'm just like, I can't even move. Like, yeah. Are you going out? I'm not, I'm going to bed. <laughs> so the jacket idea was like to kind of make people smile. Yeah. and get excited about who they are yeah. so that I'm not saying, hey, this is who I, I'm Tim and I, you know, this is what yeah. I do. And I'm like, hey, I would love, what do you do? And they say, I'd love to have you sign my jacket. Yeah. So that jacket became kind of this uh, piece of artwork. And at the end of the market, I should have it now to be able to go, this is yeah. it. So we get framed. It's I just, have a picture of it. Okay, yeah. right? you know, you know what it looked like. So did you guys sign it? Did you I did sign okay. it, but I signed it in yellow marker so you couldn't read it. <laughs> well, that's a, it's still that's part of that color it's part palette. Of the presentation. So it's yeah. amazing thing, and I got it when it was done. I thought I need to actually produce this jacket, yeah. which I may do. Like actually do a limited run of them. Yeah. Um, and I would offer buy. them. I would okay. buy. Okay. <laughs> Once um, I get <laughs> Yeah, I just think it's really cool. Like it all is. these people, and I've had people come up to me already, at Mark, one day, and say uh, they grab hold of me like. Your jacket, where's the jacket? I signed your jacket. I'm like, so that was the, That's how they remember you, too. It is. That was the idea for that. Um, and then uh, the poodle head. My wife and I were in Memphis at a show for her, and we were rambling around one evening, and we went into Urban Outfitters. And there was this, She I, she's like, Tim, and I turned around, and she's got this poodle. I'm like, whoa. And it was really freaky. Yeah. And as you know, that 
it looks really real, kind of like. So we bought, it was 33 bucks. We bought the dog head, and I was trying to think of the same kind of thing. What do I do at High Point to kind of unnerve people and bring them out of their pretentious, like, I'm the designer thing, you know? Yeah. Patty was it. So when people see that okay. dog head, they just can't help. They're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? They want to pet it. Can I? I did let someone put it on. That was a mistake. Oh, no. Then I thought like, oh, it's like rubber inside. Like yes. I don't want to. Um, and it was on the dance floor, I think, at Four Hands. And, it, and then other people were kind of grabbing at it. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> I do have a backup yeah, patty, by the way. I found another patty oh, and bought it. So I have a pristine patty put away. Um, well, now we can sleep at night. That's yeah, all yeah. that matters. But Patty, I think Patty will come back at some point, at least in limited, in limited appearance. Awesome. I'm excited for the jacket first. That's incredible. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank um, you very much for having me. Of course. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Yes. It makes it a fact that fashion forward is important at High Point Market, and it can be interactive. But I also think that's like your signature business card. It's such a cool thing. Yeah. yeah. You don't yeah. even need one. Definitely. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for tuning in, and that about wraps up this episode. Catch you Thank next you time. very much. Thank you.